Hey kids, Michael Corsentino with another fabulous lighting tutorial. This one we're talking all about creating beautiful, gorgeous, soft, super soft light. Super soft! Super soft light with one light. Yes, you heard me right. It can be done and we're going to dig in and we're going to talk all about it in this hair video. Okay, so this is a companion to my monthly lighting column in Shutter Magazine. If you guys aren't reading Shutter Magazine, if you're not currently subscribers, you're living in the past. Run right out, pause this video, pick yourself up a copy of Shutter Magazine at your local Barnes & Noble, head over to the website BehindTheShutter.com, get yourself a subscription, you can look at it online, you can get it delivered to your house. It's an awesome, awesome magazine for all your photography education needs. There are just a bunch of really committed, great people in that magazine bringing you high quality content every single month, and I'm proud to be one of them. All right, let's dig right in. So we're talking all about creating super soft portrait light, and we're gonna do this using one light. And you can see here the result. Uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna walk you through the process and show you exactly how this gorgeous image was created. Very simple tools, very simple techniques with a beautiful, sophisticated, high quality result. So we're gonna walk you through that, okay? So, um, and again, there are a lots of techniques for creating soft light, but I like to keep things simple. I think when you keep things simple, at least when I keep things simple, I'm able to really focus uh, and concentrate on being creative and not getting caught up in overly complicated, overly technical shooting environments. Um, sometimes that's what you end up with because you need to, because the shoot necessitates it. Uh, and oftentimes I'm in, you know, six, seven, eight, ten light scenarios, but there's a lot, and you've heard me preach this on numerous occasions uh, in my articles, there's just so much that you can do with one light. Uh, and a little bit of know-how and the right techniques and the right tools and you're off to the races creating gorgeous light either hard or soft or anywhere in between with one light. So let's take a look at our image. So you can see here the final image and we're gonna again we're gonna walk you through that. Uh, I'm gonna talk to you about every aspect of this shoot and get you completely dialed in on everything that went on here because I know that some of the technical stuff is important for a lot of people. All right, so let's take a little closer look at this image as well. I want you to see what it looks like, uh, a nice detail of the image so you can get a sense of the quality of light happening. And this is kind of what we're going to talk about. I'll move over here onto my drawing board canvas here and show you. So you can see the quality of light. We've got this gorgeous soft light and I'll just kind of make some marks over here on the highlight section of the image. And you can see here that while they're highlights, they're really, really soft. There's very little in the way of specularity, of contrast there. And that's all a function of the way that I have oriented my light and my modifier and the size of the modifier that I used, okay, and the angle of the modifier. We're going to touch on all of those things, all right? And you can also see that we also have a very, very gradual transition from highlight to shadow. You can see here as it moves from highlight to shadow across the face, it's very, very soft and very gradual. And that in, is really the definition of soft light. So what do we mean by soft light? We mean a gradual transition between highlight and shadow. All right. And one of the other things I want you to take note of is this very subtle, yet it is there, Rembrandt triangle. So we're working with Rembrandt style lighting uh, in a different way than we may typically be accustomed to vis-a-vis uh, -vis the angle, and I'm going to show you that. Uh, but we're still able to get, even with the technique that I'm using, this Rembrandt triangle on the face, which is a very classic lighting pattern um, that is very complementary. Uh, used a lot by, you know, a master painters, obviously named after Rembrandt. So uh, let's click off our markup layer here just so we can kind of see that cleanly again. And you can see here just a lovely quality of light. All right, let's talk about the tools that we used to get here and create this look. So you can see here the tools that I used. I started, uh, basically, as I said, it's a one light scenario. Uh, so I used a, an Ellen Chrome um, 1000 watt light head, a strobe, and this was the uh, Ellen Chrome ELC Pro HD, dynamite digital head. Uh, and I put that inside, modified that with an Ellen Chrome 74 inch indirect octabank. All right, and you can see it here with a diffuser uh, on the, um, I'm on a markup layer. Let's go back to a markup layer. Uh, you can see it here with the diffusion panel on the front, and then you can see it here 
with the light head mounted on the inside. So let's talk about what does it mean by indirect, okay? So you can see here that the strobe, uh, which is here, is facing in toward the back of the modifier. This is what's meant by indirect. And why that's important is because it further diffuses the light. It gives you a much softer quality of light than a direct source, which would be pointing out of the box toward the subject, right? So it's pointing in, away from the subject, bouncing back, hitting this diffusion panel over here, getting further broadened and further diffused, and just creating this really beautiful, soft quality of light. So can you get soft light? Can you create soft light without this particular modifier? Yes, you absolutely can. However, the raison d'etre, the reason that this modifier was designed the way that it is, and by virtue of its size, it's also 74 inches, a very large source. And as we know, the larger our source and the closer that source is to our model, to our subject, the softer that light is going to be. So that indirect orientation for our strobe is just really doing heightening that effect. It's giving us, it's going even further to give us that beautiful, soft quality of light, which was really the mission for this shoot. Okay. Now I don't get to do soft lighting a lot. It's not something that I do a lot. I love it. Uh, so it was really fun to kind of dig in and flex my soft light muscles with this shoot a little bit. And it's just, you know, when you're looking at any kind of, when you're thinking and pre-visualizing any kind of shoot, which I did here, let's click back on this. Uh, you know, the idea, I had this idea, I knew what I wanted with this particular image, with this shoot. Uh, so I just needed to choose the tools and techniques that were going to get me here. And that's really what you need to do with any photograph. Whether you want hard light or soft light, you just need to kind of deconstruct what you, what it is that you want to accomplish and figure, and then plug in the tools and techniques that are going to get you there. All right. So let's go back to our tools. Uh, right, so then I also used a reversible black and white V-flat. I brought in, uh, I used the white side and I used just a, a one part of it as a one, one flat surface of it uh, directly opposite my key light and I'll show you slides on this as well. I've got behind the scenes images to show you. And I used that opposite the key light just to open up the shadow side of the images and provide some fill light. So again, really, really simple setup here. We're talking about one light, one modifier and a reflector. Okay, and in this case, it's just a four by eight piece of foam core, white foam core. I, I've said it before and I'll say it again, V-flats are uh, you know, some of the most inexpensive uh, tools that you'll have in your studio and some of the most useful. So definitely, they can be kind of a nightmare to transport and to get, or get delivered, but they're worth the effort. And once you have them, they last you for years and you definitely should have V-flats in your studio. They're fantastic. All right, so, this particular um, modifier, this 74-inch Ellenchrome Octa, uh, has been discontinued. Now, don't be alarmed because Ellenchrome is always reinventing and recreating and improving uh, what they are offering, and they have come out with an updated version. Uh, and I'm going to show that to you now. I'm just trying to get... Uh, over there, let's take a look at the updated version. Here we go. Okay, so it is the Ellen Chrome Indirect Light Motive. Okay, it's part of their new Light Motive line of softboxes. And I've concluded the model number here for you. So in case you wanted to run out and try this and get this gear and recreate this look, this is what you would need to look for. All right, you'd need the EL28000. Yes, it sounds, wow. EL28000! So that's it, all right? So it's going to give you a beautiful quality of light. So what? why did they discontinue it? And what's the difference with this box? Well, it's got an overall superior build quality. As I said, they're always improving. Ellen Chrome is a great company, and they're always improving what they're doing. So this has uh, things like double stitching uh, you know, for build quality. It's got stronger fabric in the back. Uh, the backing material is much stronger and better fabricated. Um, it's going to give you, because this, this interior silver fabric is a lot more reflective, it gives you about a stop and a half more power, which means you can use it with, perhaps you wouldn't need a thousand watt light head, perhaps you could get away with a, with a 500 watt light head or strobe. Um, you can also use it with a quadra light head. There are adapters that will allow you to use it with, uh, for those of you guys who are using quadras, uh, Ellen Chrome's quadra strobe and pack. 
Um, it will also it can also be used with a numerous uh, strobes like Profoto, for example. There's an adapter for that. I know many of you guys shoot Profoto, uh, so you can easily adapt a Profoto light into this modifier as well, and still get this gorgeous quality of light, which you've seen and which we're going to walk through to create. Uh, it also uses this same spring-loaded mechanism. There's a, a you can see here that the strobe is held together by these um, uh, prongs in the center, and that is part of a spring-loaded uh, operation mechanism that allows you to open and close this softbox. As as large as this softbox is, and a lot of really large softboxes are kind of a nightmare to operate, this Ellen Chrome is really great about making um, easy to operate softboxes even when they're gargantuan and this is there's this uh, Okta is no different it's super easy to operate so it includes that same uh, spring-loaded mechanism um, and it can also be used one of the real, real nice things about this box a lot of people are using uh, continuous lights uh, this can now is compatible with uh, hot lights up to 600 watts uh, so you know just a lot of options with this box but at the end of the day what it's going to do, why it's important for us today, is that it's going to give you this really, really beautiful, soft quality of light because of its size and because of the indirect orientation of the strobe. All right? So let's talk about uh, grip equipment. Uh, I talked about this in the article, and I really, really is worth mentioning uh, to kind of talk about the mechanics of putting together a shoot and why this stuff is important, okay? So, and these pieces that we're looking at here, they're not inexpensive pieces, okay? But again, this is something I've been doing for almost 40 years. Um, and at this point in my career, I'm able to have these tools and I cannot tell you what a difference they make in my work and in my, um, just how pleasant it is to work with tools that are up to the task and that don't beat up your body. Having a wind-up stand, for example, this Manfrotto 378 um, XBU wind-up stand, blah, 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 it allows you to crank the light, the light head and the modifier up and down to the desired height um, without having to muscle the whole thing up. So you've got a sandbag and you've got a light and you've got a modifier and all this. I can just stand in one place. I don't have to get on a ladder and I can just crank it up and down. I mean, that alone, and this one uh, is showing the solid base. I... Uh, have the optional casters, locking casters on mine. And so I'm able to roll this thing around and crank the light up or down as needed. Uh, and it is just a phenomenal thing to have. So when you can afford it, or if you can rent it, or if you're at a studio and you can request it, use a, one of these wind-up stands. They will make your life so much easier, okay? In that same vein is this Manfrotto Mega Boom Arm, okay? The 425, Weep, right here. This thing is another one of these uh, what you know wow factor products okay again not inexpensive but man so worth it okay this is a geared boom arm with three cranks on it you've got a crank here a crank here and a crank here and then this articulating head and you can see these gears here and there are gears here uh, what this allows you to do and there's also a crank here so this is going to allow you to uh, you know change the angle from from a standing position you can also change the pitch, the angle, uh, the orientation, every last thing that you can control in terms of the angle, pitch, direction, etc. of your modifier and light head can be done using one of these three cranks, okay? And typically you can do it all uh, from ground or on a small ladder and, you know, you don't have to break your neck and bust your back. Uh, you know, reor uh, you know, just kind of adjusting and dialing in your your key light or any number of lights. I only have one of these. It's enough. I use it all the time for my key light. It's it's my it, these both these tools, both of these tools, this these you know the stand and this boom arm are what I use for my key light all the time. Right. So great stuff. Definitely worth looking into uh, when you can afford it. Uh, when it's right for you, or you can always look for it in rental houses or in studios that you're working in. Okay, so last but not least, uh, we have the meter. Okay, so Allen Chrome typically did not have a wireless meter that you could use to trigger uh, their lights and meter them, which is huge. So I'd end up with pocket wizards connected to my meter and, you know, it's all it's kind of like, or putting it, the meter in wait mode and then having to, you know, wait for the flash to go off or to take a reading is not kind of clunky and not really the way that I'm comfortable working. So Sakonic and Alan Chrome have kind of gotten together and created a meter specifically for Skyport enabled, 
um, strobes, Ellen Chrome strobes, which is phenomenal. Now, that alone is worth the price of admission. However, this new meter is a, kind of a beautiful digital interface, as you can see here, uh, and it allows you not only to, you know, obviously take meter readings from your strobes and control them wireless and, and do wireless meter readings, but you can control them also. You can control the power wirelessly. Phenomenal. So you can see that here. I've included some of the screenshots from the meter just so you can see how whiz-bang cool it is. You have the uh, meter here and you can see here that it, this indicates that it is the Ellen Chrome version. And here's the model number for you. Uh, the 478-D-R-U-E-L. It's a, a long name. But anyway, long name for an amazing meter. Okay? Does amazing things. Uh, and now here is the main screen and you can see here that obviously it's going to give you the reading. But the real... Uh, cool thing about this meter is that it puts the entire an entire power control center in the palm of your hand. So not only are you able to take readings, but you're able to then adjust uh, up to four different groups. You can see here the groups right here and you can uh, you can uh, control four groups worth of lights and those can be either individual lights or grouped lights together and you can control their power in tenth of a stop increments using these buttons here. Right? So, super cool. And then you can also see the readings for each group here, and then the overall reading there for everything together. So, I mean, really amazing. Just a really phenomenal tool uh, that I had the pleasure of working with on this shoot. Um, and, you know, it's I use it on all my shoots now with Ellen Chrome Lights. They're just, you know, why wouldn't I? It's fantastic. Um, okay, so... And again, you know, a lot of people are, oh, why should I meter in this? And that's a topic for a different discussion, but you should meter. Metering is great. Handheld meters do things that your camera's meter cannot, especially when you're working with strobe. Use a meter. It's just a tool. It's going to allow you to be more consistent uh, and quick and, you know, just gives you supreme accuracy and you'll be able to get set up for your shot before you even click the shutter. That's what I did. I just, I know what I want my key light to be at. I meter. Um, you know, and I'm done. And then I click the shutter and my light is amazing, right? So that's what metering is all about. You can hit me up in the comments if you want more information about why you should meter. All right. So all the images uh, for this shoot were captured using my Phase 1 DF Plus with an IQ250 digital back. Uh, and I switched between an 80 millimeter uh, Schneider Kreuznach 80 uh, millimeter F2.8 and a 153.5, I believe, 3.5, 3.2, 3.5, I'm not sure. But anyway, um, the image that we're looking at, the final image that we took, that we saw uh, when we opened up this presentation was shot with the 80 millimeter lens. I use the 80 all the time. It's my favorite lens. Um, so that's where I, where I captured the images. Uh, moving on, I made this, the, the sort of the design for this portrait shoot was something that I had in mind and it required a nice kind of painted backdrop. I wanted something very classical, very editorial looking. Uh, and for that, I chose um, the Emily Soto Eleanor backdrop available from SeamlessPhoto.com. Uh, it's comparable to backdrops that cost, uh, you know, five times uh, as much. Um, maybe not five times, maybe three and a half times as much. Um, maybe more, maybe four times. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, it's comparable with, this is about $400, um, uh, 339 for the, for the 10 by 10, I think, and then it goes up to 10 by 20. I got the 10 by 20. Um, but there are, uh, there's, there are backdrops by a company called Oliphant, it's a backdrop, and they make gorgeous backdrops. There's no arguing with them. They're fantastic, and they're uh, based in, I think, Brooklyn or New York. Uh, but they're like $1,600 a piece, and I, I want one, and they're on my list, and I will have one them one day. Uh, but, you know, this seamless, this Eleanor background that Emily Soto uh, created, and that's available through SeamlessPhoto.com, is just amazing, as you have you've seen, and you'll, cause you'll see throughout these photos. It just yields beautiful results uh, at a fraction of the cost. Uh, so also, uh, uh, key to this shoot was... Um, bringing in a couple of new studio uh, props, new posing props for the studio. And these uh, were acquired with this kind of shoot in mind, this kind of editorial shoot that I, that I had wanted to create with this very soft light editorial kind of look. So I uh, contracted a um, prop house in Brooklyn and I had them create these uh, distressed... Um, I'll see if I can get back here. No, I can't. Uh, here we go. Okay, cool. Uh, I had them create these distressed apple boxes, um, and then I found this um, vintage 
uh, garden shop uh, on eBay, oddly enough, um, that sold, you know, that specialized in vintage uh, garden elements. And they also did kind of faux painting stuff. And I had them custom paint this ladder for me. Cost me about a hundred bucks, right? Uh, amazing. That was shipped, a hundred bucks. So, you know, props are really going to be important. Like that, you cannot underestimate or overestimate. Uh, you can't overestimate the um, importance of really great, you know, props when you're doing a stylized shoot. Uh, and I'm really, really picky about props. Uh, you know, good styling and good, you know, good prop styling is key for creating a beautiful editorial kind of image, especially studio image. Uh, there's a lot of cheese whiz kind of, you know, stuff out there that I'm not a big fan of. Um, and maybe some people aren't a fan of this look, but the, for me this works and it kind of speaks to my aesthetic. Uh, so I love these props and that's what they were all, that's what getting them was all about for, was for this style of shoot and this particular shoot. So it was really a, a joy to, uh, to work with them and I'll continue to do so. Okay, so let's talk about the lighting diagram. Let's talk about our camera settings. So here you can see the lighting diagram. Um, and you can see the orientation and the angle, and this is really important, the angle of the softbox. Okay, so you can see here that this is at a 90 degree angle. It is not at the typical 45 degree angle, and I'll just go like that, that we typically see when we're doing Rembrandt lighting or that sort of side lighting. So I'm just going to take that off. We're working with a 90 degree angle, and the other thing I want you to pay attention to is the position front to back in relationship to the model. You can see here that our model is nearly behind the softbox, behind the light modifier, okay? And what's happening there is you're working with the feathered part of the light, the softest part of the light. So let's unpack that for a minute. When you're working with a modifier, a modifier is going to diffuse the light from this from the strobe inside of it. Now in this case we're lucky because we've got our the Ellen Chrome softbox has it's an indirect uh, orientation for the light so the light is pointing to the back of the softbox. It is then radiating out hitting all the silver interior here uh, and then hitting this diffusion material on the front. But right here even with that in the center is going to be the, the hottest most specular part of that light. Right. Now we don't want that when we're doing when we're looking for soft light. If you were doing something that was more hard light, more specular, uh, that fit that look, then maybe you would work with the center. But in this case, that's not what I wanted. I wanted this, which you can see here, this beautiful soft quality of light. So in order to get that, you need to work with feathered light. Okay. So the feathered light is going to be all the light that's happening here at the edge or behind the softbox, all of this stuff in here. This is getting very messy, but that's, that's, you know, that's what it is. Okay. So forgive the mess, but take away the message. Soft light happens at the edges of your softbox. Feathered light. You want to work with the feathered portion of the light. All right. So the other thing that we have going on here is we have our white foam core four by eight sheet of white foam core. This is a V flat. So there's also this part here, which we're not seeing. Okay, and that is opposite the key light. So this light is coming here and bouncing off of here and then bouncing back on to our subject and opening up uh, the shadowed side, in this case, the camera right side of our model. And again, people give me, give me hell for this uh, in, the com in the comments on YouTube, but because uh, it looks like a football diagram with all the red marks and stuff, but just deal with it. Um, okay, so that's it. I mean, it's as simple as that. It really doesn't get more complicated than that. I try to give myself a little bit of distance between the background and here and here, depending on how much kind of detail that I want on the background to show through and what my f-stop is. Okay, so you also need to be cognizant of that. We're not shooting on white seamless, so we need to kind of think about how far we place our model from the background. Uh, how much light from our one from our light source is going to reach that background and also how much detail from the background pattern in this case this painted seamless that we want showing up in our image and that's going to be dictated by the distance and also by the f-stop that we're using. So my final settings for this shoot were f11, the ISO was 100, 125th of a second and again I used the 80 millimeter lens. All right so let's continue on here. 
I wanted to include for you some BTS photos just so you could see how everything was unfolding in the studio. So you can see here the uh, modifier and you can see its position. This is the Allen Chrome Octabank. And you can see that it is at the 90 degree orientation and you can see the backdrop. And you can see here that my model cat is really, you know, pretty much behind that light. And all of that gorgeous diffused feathered light is just providing this beautiful even illumination here. And our fill board, 4x8 foam core, is just kicking in all the fill here that we needed. Right. You can also see the edge of the softbox right there, uh, just so you can get an idea of really how close, what the distance is. It's very, very close. Just outside of the composition, just outside of my framing, is where I want that light. Okay. Uh, let's talk about a few other things. Okay. So here is the result of that. I mean, that's what that's what's going to give you this just gorgeous light that we see here. Right. Beautiful, soft transitions, uh, very elegant lighting. All right, so let's talk about how I kind of dialed this in. Whenever you're starting a shoot and you set up your lights, it's not just going to be perfect right away. You have to dial it in. So I'm going to walk you through the steps that it took for me to get this exactly where I wanted it in terms of the light quality. All right, so first off, when we were doing the posing on the Apple box, I started off here and I could see get over to my markup layer, that, uh, you know, this was too dark. All of this stuff down here was really kind of falling into shadow. And that was because my key light and the modifier were positioned a little too high. They were probably around here. It probably started somewhere around there, right? Um, and when I saw that, I realized, hey, you know what? You had better, even with the biggest, even with a large source like I was using, I needed to readjust and move it down so that it was more like here, okay? And once I did that, I had much more even illumination all the way across the entire subject, right? And you can see here, it's subtle, but it's definitely there. It definitely opens it all up. You can see it here, you can see it here, you can see it on the legs and the shoes, you can see it on the ground. It opens all that stuff up. So again, here we've just lowered the key light to provide more even coverage from top to bottom, all right? Next thing that I wanted to do was, that I'm sort of constantly looking, constantly evaluating, and I'm noticing that all of this is just way too dark for my liking. It's really not the look that I wanted to go for. Now, I love dimensional lighting. I love a shadowed look. Uh, I'm not afraid of shadows, but for this particular look, I wanted something a little bit more open, and I loved this dress. The, the, the wardrobe that we picked for this was just beautiful and on point. It had a gorgeous pattern, and I was like, you know, we're losing it here. It's gone in, without, uh, with all these shadows, which is just disappearing on us, and, you know, all this is just kind of, there's no separation here. Uh, this is all really muddy and dark, and, and muddy is a really good word. I just don't want, didn't want things to be muddy. I wanted things to be very elegant and very soft, right? So, adding in that V-flat, and in this case, right over here, right? It's just going to pop light in all over here, and it's going to just brighten things up, and you can really see it in the face, right? All here, you can see that it opens this up, opens all this up, uh, and just, you know, opens this up as well. All these areas just get kind of opened up and a lot more, um, I don't know, for lack of a better word, accessible, more open feeling to the image, okay? So that takes care of that. So the next thing that I want to talk to you about is feathering. So you can modulate your feathering um, and, you know, kind of find your sweet spot for what kind of feathering you're looking at. I mean, it doesn't have to be, it can, feathering can be any number of things. It's soft light, but soft light has variations. It can be very, very, very soft, or it can be moderately soft, okay? And what I mean by moderately soft or very, very, very soft is it can have either, it can have some specular highlights or it can have none, very, very few specular highlights, like almost none, okay? So, and that's kind of the look that I was going for for this. I wanted a very, very soft, I'm gonna say flat, but very soft look. It's not flat because it's got shadowing, it's got dimension, but I wanted a really soft look. I didn't want very much in the way of specular highlights, 
right? So let's take a look at what we've got going on here. Here is our moderately lightly feathered image, the first one over on the left. And you can see here, and I won't draw on her face just so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. You can see that it's brighter than the image on the right. It's still very soft, it's still feathered, but it's brighter. It's got specularity, it's got um, highlights, brighter highlights. Uh, than the image on the right. And that, I, I wanted to sort of vary that and, you know, play with it and see what I could come up with. And, and I ended up liking what I got when I moved the entire uh, softbox uh, all forward a little bit, okay? So I, I was increasing the amount of feather by doing that. In essence, placing my model even further behind the softbox, okay? So the amount of feather is going to increase as I pull that light further and further away from my model, front to back, all right? So you can see here now that I've got this very different quality of light here, right? Much more soft, much, you know, it just gives this kind of soft-spoken quality to the image, really elegant and really understated. And that's really what I wanted. There's nothing wrong with the image on the left. It's just a little bit brighter, a little more punchy uh, than I really wanted for this application, right? So that's how you control feather, and so the same thing's going to be true of your of your um, V flat. I didn't talk about that, but you know your fill light, you're going to want to find your sweet spot with that as well. You're going to move it in and out until just the right amount of fill is provided for whatever you're doing. Okay, so just keep that in mind as well. All right, so keeping it simple really just provides you. Uh, you know, again, it allows you to really focus on your creativity. And when you keep it simple, think like this shoot ended up being an embarrassment of riches. I mean, there was just so much beautiful content to choose from um, that it, the editing was a bit of a, a bit of a bear. And here you're seeing uh, the, my first round of selects, and I ended up narrowing it down even further. But um, because I don't, I, obviously I'm not going to edit all these, but I, I ended up with about 15 finals, and I'll probably edit those down again. Um, but just a ton of beautiful images to work with, um, because I kept things simple, and I wasn't focusing on all this technical mumbo-jumbo. I was just really focusing on creating a beautiful set of images, right? So lastly, I want to talk to you uh, about uh, the post-processing, which I did... Um, largely in Capture One Pro. So Capture One Pro is a raw editing uh, a raw editing application uh, that Phase One uh, created. It's amazing. You can use it with DSLR. You can use it with medium format. It is my go-to uh, phenomenal piece of software. So on the right, you're seeing the raw conversion uh, without much done to it. Uh, and then on the, I'm sorry, on the left, you're seeing uh, the raw conversion without much done to it. And then on the right, you're seeing the color grading uh, and the subtle vignette that I applied to it. And then I brought it into Photoshop and uh, took care of the um, skin retouching um, and a little light housekeeping. But pretty much I extended the, uh, you can see here that the, uh, I had to add a little bit of background over here on the left side because it's there's not that much happening over here on the uh, on the on the left, right on the right image, I extended this amount. I, I have a drawing markup layer here. Yeah, let's see if I can give you another layer. There we go. So I just kind of extended this area because you can see here that there's not a whole lot going on there. Uh, so I wanted to extend that. So let's turn that off. Uh, and I just created this really nice uh, kind of tone that, just, to me, feels uh, editorial and feels right for this kind of subject matter. Uh, so all the color grading was done in uh, Capture One Pro, uh, Capture One Pro 9. So that's it. That's going to wrap it up for this video. Here's our final again. And here's a close-up version just to kind of bring home the point that um, you can create soft light really easily. Uh, can you do this with an umbrella? Can you do it with uh, you know a modifier perhaps that you have now if you don't have this big Octobank? Absolutely, you can. Uh, you know, just focus on feathering. Focus on uh, you know where you place your light, the angle of the light. Um, and I think you'll have uh, some great results. So that's going to wrap it up for this month. Until next month, and this is going to be in the August uh, issue of Shutter Magazine. I should have mentioned that up front, but uh, there you go. So until next month, this has been Michael Corsentino, and I will see you next time.